When scientists look at a pine tree, they see much more than a pile of standing wood. They see how the tree relates to its surroundings, how its cells use chlorophyll, air, and water to capture energy, energy that is used to make seeds of new trees, but which often become food for birds and other animals. All of these aspects combine to form what is called the construct of a pine tree. It is important to understand that the construct of the pine tree can be altered, but the pine tree itself remains unchanged. Atoms and electrons, which are too small to be seen directly, are more complicated and abstract constructs than the simple pine tree system. Theories such as the evolution of life are even more abstract. Atoms, electrons, evolution, they can't be seen like the pine tree, but we accept them. Why? Because they are very useful. Constructs enable us to predict new things, link ideas together, and better understand why certain things happen. Suppose, for example, we release a hot air balloon and watch it rise. This suggests a theory that gravity causes objects to repel each other. But if we test the theory by releasing a ball, our theory's predictions do not hold up. Instead, a quite different theory is suggested, that gravity causes some objects to attract each other. Repeated tests confirm the new prediction that objects attract, establishing the validity of the new theory. But this does not make the theory or construct an absolute fact. It is still only a creation of the intellect and kept only as long as it is useful. Experiments in the 21st century could show that between galaxies in space or in the minute distances inside atoms, gravity may not cause things to attract at all. So the constructs and theories developed by scientists are kept as long as they are accurate in prediction. They are replaced when more useful constructs are found. The construct of magnetism has given rise to important theories in geology. Scientists know that the Earth acts as a huge magnet surrounded by a magnetic field with strength and direction that produce the north and south magnetic poles as indicated by a compass needle. In a similar manner, the Earth's magnetic field lines up the iron minerals in molten lava as it solidifies into rock. Rocks of different ages are analyzed with a magnetometer to determine the direction of the Earth's magnetic field at the time the rocks were formed. As early as 1906, geophysicists became aware that the Earth's magnetic field has periodically reversed itself. During periods of reversed magnetism, the north-seeking end of a compass needle would point south. A time scale of magnetic reversals has been established and dated. During the period shown in blue, the field was normal, as today. It was reversed during the time period shown in orange. A magnetometer can be towed by a ship or plane over the Earth to measure any differences in the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. Rocks whose magnetic fields are oriented in the same direction as the Earth's present field reinforce the Earth's field, giving an above average magnetic reading. This is called a positive magnetic anomaly. If the rocks of an area have a reversed magnetic orientation, they partially cancel the Earth's present field and give a below average reading, a negative magnetic anomaly. In 1960, a new theory emerged called seafloor spreading, seemingly unrelated to magnetism. It proposed that an ocean basin begins as a great crack or rift in a continent through which molten rock wells up from the hot mantle below. A cycle of rifting and lava eruptions moves older lava away from the rift with a motion like that of a conveyor belt. The process of seafloor spreading is believed to have formed the Atlantic Ocean Basin and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge over the past 165 million years. Here in Iceland, which sits right on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, we can see seafloor spreading at work. Great cracks in the ground tell of the tremendous forces involved in the opening of a wide rift valley.
Molten rock rising into the Rift Valley produces spectacular volcanic eruptions, landforms, and hot water springs, all of which have become a common part of the Icelandic way of life. Two British scientists, Vine and Matthew, suggested that reversals of the Earth's magnetic field could provide evidence to support the theory of seafloor spreading. They predicted that igneous rocks such as these which make up the ocean floor should contain a record of the Earth's magnetic reversals. Since the rock spreads about equally in both directions from the rift, they reasoned there should be a pattern of alternating positive and negative magnetic anomalies on each side of the ridge axis. Each band represents an upwelling of lava that cooled and was moved aside to make room for later eruptions. A large amount of magnetic data in the rift region was obtained to see if the predicted pattern of magnetic anomalies existed. This is the stripe pattern of magnetic anomalies found at the East Pacific Rise, a section of the mid-ocean ridge. The positive anomaly stripes are colored red. It is believed the stripe pattern develops in this manner. When molten rock upwelling at the rift solidifies, it preserves a record of the Earth's magnetic field as it was at that time. When the field was the same as it is now, the rocks formed have a higher than average reading. But rock formed when the magnetic field was reversed has a lower than average reading. Since this rock lies next to the older rock, a stripe pattern of magnetic anomalies is formed. Another way to check the seafloor spreading hypothesis is to study the sediments of the ocean basins. Normally, sediments collect in horizontal layers with the youngest at the top. But if new ocean floor is being created at a mid-ocean ridge, the arrangement of sediments will be different. Sediments in contact with the ocean floor nearest the ridge will be young, while those in contact farther away will be older. Special drilling equipment was built to bore holes in the seafloor thousands of meters below the surface. In the Atlantic, a number of holes were drilled to bring up cores of sediments resting on the mid-ocean ridge and at various distances on either side of it. Each core contains a sequence of sediments down to and including the ocean basin bedrock found at its particular location. The age of each sediment layer was determined by analyzing its fossils. The bottom layer was found to be progressively older as the ship moved away from the ridge, further evidence that new ocean floor was being continuously created at the ridge as the theory of seafloor spreading contended. Heat currents in the mantle are believed to be responsible for the spreading process. According to the theory, hot mantle material rises beneath the mid-ocean ridge, cracking the crust and creating a rift. If this is so, heat flow along the ridge should be higher than normal. To measure the amount of heat reaching the ocean floor from the Earth's interior, oceanographers use a tube containing heat sensors. This device, called a thermoprobe, is thrust into the bottom sediments. After a time, the lower sensor will read a higher temperature than the upper one. The heat flow data obtained confirm the prediction that heat flow at the mid-ocean ridges is higher than that at continental margins, abyssal plains, and trenches. Remember that seafloor spreading is a construct that made these predictions. There should be a stripe pattern of magnetic anomalies on either side of the mid-ocean rift. Sediments should increase in age moving away from the ridge in both directions. And there should be a relatively high level of heat flow along the ridge. The acceptability of the seafloor spreading theory was greatly enhanced by these three successful predictions. Increased knowledge and advanced technology may further confirm the theory of seafloor spreading or perhaps additional data will emerge leading to an entirely new, more useful construct.